Um, I completed my undergraduate in a uh, bachelor's degree in social work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, back in the late 90s, which uh, forever ago. Uh, started uh, my career um, as, a, as a social worker and then went back to graduate school to get my master's in social work uh, starting in 2002 and completed that in 2004. Um, uh, in between the, those two periods of time, I worked at a drug and alcohol counseling agency right out of college called Stepping Stone Counseling and Education Services. And after that, I was a probation officer uh, for an evolution. I worked very closely with victims of, of crime, specifically domestic violence, and really became interested in, in the systems that impacted them and the services that they received um, beyond whatever support the courts could provide. So when I left probation, I was executive director of a small nonprofit in New York PA called the Victim Assistance Center, which is now part of the YWCA of York, but then it was an independent nonprofit that served victims of sexual assault and all other crimes except domestic violence. Uh, there was a separate agency in New York that provided those services. Um, although I was not the person providing day-to-day -day support, um, to the folks who came in to see us, I oversaw the daily operations of that organization. Um, I also worked for the Office of the Victim Advocate um, in Harrisburg, which is a state government agency that provides uh, support to folks uh, who are victims of crime perpetrated by people who are in the state parole and state prison systems in Pennsylvania. From that position, I went to Pike County, Pennsylvania, which is where I met Morgan, um, and uh, was director of Safe Haven of Pike County, which when I started, was an agency that served victims of domestic and sexual violence. And when I left, it served victims of all crimes. And we had added a multidisciplinary team that eventually evolved into a children's advocacy center. The nonprofit world has um, usually been the recipient of funding for um, crime victim services because we're allowed to operate outside the system and provide sort of the, the, out, the services beyond what the system can provide. Um, in the case of domestic violence, that might be safe shelter, uh, support groups, um, court accompaniment, which sometimes um, court-based victim advocates do, but we're able to do for a longer term and provide a, a wider variety of services. Um, and I think the nonprofit setting probably is a little bit more um, warm and welcoming compared to uh, the criminal justice system's response, although that is very important as well. Um, within our own office, we definitely had a culture of being victim advocates. We had most of us have come from um, either local nonprofit programs or local district attorney based programs. So we had that perspective of sort of boots on the ground, um, hand holding support. Um, what was different is we were often literally walking people to the parole board to, to talk to um, um, the parole board members who would be making decisions on cases, whether to release someone or not. And sort of bridging the gulf between their perspective, which was very much system-based, and, and the experience of the victim, which was very specific and personal. It was pro I probably had an easier lift bridging that gap because I was had been a probation officer. And I could talk about doing the work from within the system as well as the perspective of someone who was strictly a victim advocate. But part of the, the task was to sort of demonstrate why the way a crime victim might behave makes sense in the context of what they've experienced, even when it didn't make sense to us maybe as advocates or certainly to them as parole board members, but they sort of walk them through the experience. And it, it was eye-opening for them. They would often remark that it never had occurred to them, you know, what that impact was until they heard it from the, from the mouth of the folks who experienced it. I found out about the ACLU. I, I was looking to relocate to this area. I had become familiar with it, liked it very much, um, and was started by looking for a job here. And I had done a lot of events-based uh, fundraising, um, mail campaigns, that kind of stuff in my capacity as executive director of small nonprofits. I had not done any major gifts fundraising. And this the position I'd applied for, the director of development, was very focused on building relationships with individual donors and um, uh, bringing in their support of our work. So I, I wanted to add that to my um, toolkit and sort of round out my, my resume of you know, 
what it took to be a good nonprofit executive director. So I came to the ACLU in, I believe my first day was October 10th, 2016. When I arrived, I don't think any of us expected the, the presidential election to go in the direction it went, as so many of us did. Um, and I do believe it really changed what the job was going to be um, and truly changed the culture of not just the ACLU of Delaware, but the culture of the ACLU nationally as, as country looked to the ACLU to make change um, and to sort of take, take up the fight when there wasn't anybody else to take up the fight that we were facing. Um, my challenge as development director, I was you know, never having sat down across from a donor just to have coffee and talk about, you know, uh, what, how their, you know, their, their giving could support the work we were doing. I was very intimidated by that process and then discovered that they were so honestly and sometimes traumatized or at the very least um, really, really shaken by the fact that, that uh, the election had gone the way it went, that I didn't have to worry about doing any of the talking. They did the talking. They talked about their their concerns, their fears, and what they wanted to see the ACLU do. Um, and all I had to say was, well, this is what we're doing. You know, this is the work we're doing here in Delaware. This is the work we're doing nationally. And your gift can support that work. So it was, it, it certainly helped with the challenge of fundraising. Um, but it also, it, it I, I think just, and not having been at the ACLU before that, but I can say it seemed to transform the entire ACLU, ACLU in a very short time, especially since the public put so much trust in the ACLU and its affiliates to, to, to be the defender of civil liberties in that time. The, there was a change in that moment that the folks who had always supported the ACLU and always sort of understood its role in American civil liberties, um, the, and I'm not sure how that connection was made, but a lot of folks who had never made that connection before suddenly made that connection, which is why membership, I think, more than doubled um, over those years. And, and in fact, that might be a conservative estimate. We, you know, I was framing it in terms of, you know, the resources that um, the Justice Department had at the national level versus what the small but mighty force that the ACLU had at the national level and at the affiliate level and their support really was putting together a legal army uh, to push back against that agenda. Um, and, and that the ACLU had that expertise that they were probably the only person that could do it with those limited resources. Just, uh, you know, the legal department, Rich Morse was the legal director when I was there and just great perspective, great uh, knowledge of Delaware and its systems. And then, you know, the legal department expanded. We, uh, uh, Ryan uh, Tack Hooper was the director and Karen Lance was staff attorney and I think she was legal director after Ryan left but they were just amazing minds um, and just great energy to be around but there there wasn't anybody there that didn't it didn't feel that way it was, it was a good place to be um, you know also I think getting to work with um, some of the advocates that were came on board as part of like the smart justice project um, Debard McGriff uh, Javon Rich, who I'm st and I'm still lucky to get to talk to and work with most of these people every day in my current role. Um, in addition to not knowing much about um, uh, major gifts fundraising, I didn't know anything about community organizing other than a basic understanding of what it was. And getting to see, learn about it from those people was really, really amazing. They were great at it. When I was hired, uh, having worked inside the system so much, not necessarily as a victim advocate, but probably as probation, our, our director asked me, what made you decide to change sides? And she said so, obviously, with a little bit of a joke, but it was also an acknowledgement that, that the system is, is, is I'm not going to say the system is broken. I think the system does what it's designed to do, which is to oppress people, um, certain groups of people. But... Um, the system is not friendly to victims either. Um, in my experience, sometimes it is more than others, but it's, I think, always under the, the, the group of crime victims, particularly victims of domestic violence, victims of sexual assault, are themselves an oppressed group of people. So that understanding really helped to a point to understand the work the ACLU was doing. 
but also just to, to put into context is how the system can fail people at every level um, and relating that to the work of the ACLU. It's, you know, it's from the three-fifths compromise uh, on, it's built into our government system. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure we can shake off how much of a foundational thing that is, that systemic racism is in particular, until we are willing to admit it is a problem and, and not accept anyone in any kind of public capacity saying it's not a problem. We kind of have to agree upon that before I think we can move forward. I think the campaign for smart justice has been um, incredibly vital. Um, you know, in the last year, I, is it, for a combination of so many factors, maybe because everyone was home for COVID watching what had happened to George Floyd, I think that triggered a nerve. But the campaign for smart justice was already working um, in that arena and very laser focused on policing and criminal justice reform before that moment and has been even at our in my current role at the Delaware Center for Justice, we're we're very active partners with that campaign. So it's it's critical work. Um, the education lawsuit, um, I think that was you know we didn't know where that was going to go, but it has proven to be a success and transformative. So that's that's huge. Um, I know before I got there, they they had um, the Delaware repeal campaign had been working, and I know the. The Supreme Court decision uh, technically ended uh, the death penalty in Delaware, so that was a lot of really important work that was done around that, and hopefully that becomes a permanent thing. Um, and that, those, that was the big work that was going on while I was there. Um, well, as I said, I came aboard to round out my fundraising skills. Um, and I, it had always been my intention to go back to being a director of a nonprofit, hopefully something larger than I had, had uh, worked with in the past. And the Delaware Center for Justice opportunity had come up. I mean, that was, was a perfect blend of advocacy and direct service that really speaks to everything I'd done in my career. It was sort of a culmination. Right. Well, I am uh, the executive director, but the agency, uh, does the work, and that is, we started 101 years ago, it'll be 101 years next month, um, as the um, Prisoner Aid Society of Delaware, uh, which was an entirely advocate or advocacy organization geared toward prison reform. Uh, over the years, our the scope of our work expanded, and we added on direct service programming um, in the criminal justice space to fast forward to now, and we are probably at about 90% um, direct service focus and about 10% advocacy focus. Um, but our, our largest program is our reentry program. Um, we are working with, we have a, a program that's been around for 20 years called, or more than 20 years called the Community Reintegration Services Program. And that provides evidence-based case management for folks during reentry. Um, that started out in Newcastle County exclusively. And then in the last few years has moved into Kent and Sussex. And last year, uh, we secured a contract to do transitional reentry, which has us doing intensive reentry work right from the prison gate for the first 90 days of uh, following release. Um, we have programming for juveniles who are both uh, detained and juveniles who are in the community, including programming that offers them an opportunity expun at expungement if they uh, complete their, their programming. We have um, a, a mediation program and we have adult victim services for adults over 50, um, in addition to our policy work. Um, and all of that um, is, is the day-to-day -day work of DCJ. I can probably um, talk a little bit about what usually happens during the reentry process, which is really the process of someone coming home from prison. Um, and, that, and everything that entails, getting back into the workforce, you know, reintegrating with family or loved ones, or, or even just a new living space, um, connecting with community resources to help someone, you know, on the outside meet whatever needs they have. Um, that may include, um, you know, accessing mental health or, or, or substance abuse um, counseling services, but but not always. Um, really, it's it's about figuring out how to meet basic human needs, but. Uh, 
the barriers to that are are unique because folks don't necessarily want to hire someone who has a record. And, um, there may even be certain licenses and, and certifications one cannot get because of having a criminal record. So that's you know our job as as you know working alongside, but not being probation and parole services as reentry providers is to help folks overcome those barriers and, and become as successful as they can be. Our advocacy work along that those lines is to attempt to permanently remove some of those barriers, um, like the the consequences of having unpaid fines and fees, or, or you know, they're like I know one of the initiatives the ACLU is working on now is the Clean Slate Initiative, which provides for expungement, and that's something we we support because it takes away those barriers and helps people to reintegrate. My perspective um, from my own career past, um, it really informs the, the where I see our existing legal system. I won't say criminal justice system because I don't know that it is always just. Um, I see a very limited use for the system as it is. Um, I was actually having this conversation with someone earlier this week about you know the difference between. Um, Someone who someone argued with me that the you know maybe the uh, system was geared should be geared toward punishment, and even as a probation officer, my feel my especially working with a caseload of people who committed crimes of domestic violence was always about safety. Someone didn't go back to jail unless someone's safety was in, was at stake. Any any other circumstances, we're going to work with someone in the community. Um, and I truly think that literally taking someone out of society. Um, who may present a danger is the only only service that our our, our system provides as it is. Um, there is not enough rehabilitative programming. There's not access to programming. Folks tend to not come out with any more skills than they go in, and that's not their fault. It's because the opportunity to gain those skills is not there because we are so focused on punishment, and it doesn't work. It doesn't give folks, folks spend the rest of their lives just trying to, to, you know, scratch to get close to where they were before they went in, in terms of opportunity and resources, instead of coming out with some base on which to build a, a new and better life. I don't think everyone who went to jail ever entirely needed to be rehabilitated either. They probably, they may be there because they severely lacked opportunities. So I think the cry for us to address the problems that lead people to jail in the first place is louder than it's ever been, and that's a good thing. The the cry from the side that thinks prison should only exist to keep people locked up, um, I think there's been some backlash to to that other perspective from those folks, but maybe not as strong as we could have expected. I always try to be guardedly optimistic, but I don't know that. I think we still got a lot of work to do. I think we're all actually maybe the best way to put it is we're only just getting started because people are starting to see how the system does not work as it is finally and demanding that it, it work differently. Maybe the only positive to come out of the pandemic for, for us as an organization is that it caused us to stop and think and slow down a little bit in that planning process. And the, the best pools we've gotten out of that have been a new vision and mission statement. Our vision is simply justice for all Delawareans with the obvious understanding that Access to justice is different for different groups of people. You know, white people have much more access than black and brown people who have been systemically oppressed. So we're going to focus our efforts on the systemic changing the systemic oppression. Our new mission is that we listen, we amplify, and we act to seek justice for all Delawareans through advocacy and services. And we created that framework to sort of give us a guide in all the work we do. Is the work we're doing now? How much of that is listening? How much of that is amplifying? How much? And, you know, it's okay if it's all one or the other, as long as we are doing all three of those things and that we are really listening to and amplifying and acting on behalf of the people who, who are being oppressed by the system as it is. Um, and not in, a, not in a way as we see fit, but if we're really listening in a way that they see fit. Uh, so ideally, at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, the impacted community looks to DCJ as a tool for its use to make change instead of 
an organization that has its own agenda that maybe it fits with the community and maybe it doesn't. That's not our place. We see our place in, in that listening role to hear what the community needs DCJ to be and not to be what we think it should be. We launched our transitional reentry program during the pandemic, which means we were picking up folks at the prison gate who were who had tested positive for COVID. Um, and I think one of the big things that's changed is we used to talk about people who've been in prison for 10, 15, 20 years and say, oh my goodness, they're coming out the cell phones and the internet. And now if you were in jail for two years, it's a different world. Um, the vaccine is changing that to an extent, I think. Um, but if there's still, you know, it's affected the job market, it's affected economics, and that's, that's all part of re-entry and what folks face with. Um, but I think the biggest thing it's, it's illustrated is, and it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone, but I guess it has been, is that even the pandemic was racist. Even the pandemic was, you know, was prejudiced against poor people because that's who's been hurt the most by this. So justice issues always go back to matters of race and poverty in this country. And, and that the folks who are, you know, do not have white privilege like myself or folks who do not have economic means are the ones who are going to be most harmed by every bad thing that happens to the United States.